I um, went to the conference yesterday, so I missed all the exciting sport action that was going on yesterday. But I was reminded as I was thinking about this of sport matches I've been to. Um, I don't know whether you've been to any. Um, I went to one, um, ooh, about August time, I went to see Wales at the Principality play South Africa, where Wales got absolutely thumped. But the point was, is you're there in a crowd of 90,000 people. And I tell you, I would even buy the ticket, even if I didn't care about rugby, to go and sit in that stand when all those people stand up, mainly men, and they sing Bread of Heaven. It just sends tingles down your spine. And I find myself thinking sometimes, is that what heaven like, just with even more people? Because I don't get often many chances to go and worship. And let's face it, it is worship. They all stand up and worship their team. But to worship when they sing a hymn like that, at the top of their voice, you know, feed me now until I need no more. You know, it's just so awesome. You think, is this what it's going to sound like when in the middle of the pitch is the throne of God and we're all standing around and all these people are singing out, oh, glory to God. You know, those songs we've been singing this morning, how great is our God. We thought about his amazing creation, how great thou art. I'm sorry the words didn't come up on how great thou art, but what a song. What an absolute incredible song. When I look at all these things, how great are you? I know that sometimes um, I put that up there because when you go to a sports match, like a football match, sometimes you can't bear to watch. Sometimes it's too tense. You might be drawing and you, your team's doing really badly. Um, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. But then you never know. You, you may score. And you may take the lead. And then suddenly, the most amazing thing happens. All these men who have no emotions, who don't want to do anything, who, you yeah, know, I'm not like that. I'm not an emotional person. Are suddenly out of their seats going nuts. They're cheering, they're shouting, their hands are in the air. I remember a game I went to many years ago with my son John to take him to see his team away at a team called West Ham, if you've heard of them. And um, they were losing 1-0. And it was getting to the end of, towards half time. You know, John, my nice, quiet, reserved little boy. And then... Reading scored, sorry, the, his team scored. And it was one all, and he was excited. He jumped out of his seat, he was cheering. The home end were all, no, the way end, sorry, that's where he was, was really excited. But oh, within five minutes, they scored again. And I saw John leap out of his chair, disappear down the, down the aisle. I don't know where he want, got to. I thought he turned into a kangaroo. And he was bouncing all over the place, hugging people he didn't know. But that's what happens when you have a spontaneous response to something. And I just wanted to just really get us to think. Here we have the people of God spontaneously rejoicing about what God had done. I mean, I, mean, I don't know what you think of all this. I don't know how you imagine this. Maybe because I grew up in church, I'm used to this story. But has it just become a story? Do you just imagine, oh, it's a nice story. Is it like reading Little Red Riding Hood or, I don't know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears or whatever? It's a nice story, yeah, it's lovely. Can you not imagine that this is actually history? This actually took place. You see, you might have seen the movies. I must admit I've never actually seen the movie. I have seen Bruce Almighty where he does it to the tomato soup. But, you know, I mean, but nobody walks through the tomato soup, do they? But, you know, I've seen that. So I can kind of imagine it. But can you just imagine what, I mean, I was just thinking, how would you feel? First of all, you're faced with the sea. Then the sea suddenly parts and you're told to walk through it with these walls of water either side because that's what it says in there. Then you get to the other side. You turn around and... Um, Let's see if I... And you see Pharaoh's army approaching. And you can't bear to look. And you're horrified because they're coming after you. 
You don't know what's happening. You, know, you, can, see, you can see them all coming, can't you? You hear the thunder of the horse hooves. You can hear the wheels of the chariots turning around. You can see their, their armor and their swords and everything glinting in the sun as they shine, come charging towards you. Probably a great big plume of dust. You know, here they're coming to get you. You can't bear to look. Or maybe they were super spiritual. And they just said, oh yeah, that's okay. God's in control. I, I tend to think where I might end up thinking. It takes a man of faith to think, oh yeah, that's all under control. There's a path. There's the army coming towards me. But suddenly there's a mighty roar as all the seas just crash down on this, on this army. And you see them absolutely engulfed in water. And you're saved. The ones who are coming to destroy you have been destroyed. The ones who wanted to take you captive were now trapped. And you are saved. No wonder there was a spontaneous, it says, doesn't it? It says, Moses and the people of Israel sang. They all sang spontaneously. Relief, I imagine, and joy. Relief because they have been saved. Rejoicing because they are saved. Can you imagine that exuberance just filling the air as everyone's just celebrating they're free? Cheers and shouts as they all, as they all jump up in the air. Can you imagine it? I mean, it sounds a bit gory, doesn't it? I mean, it's not the sort of thing you want to paint on your children's wall, is it? A lot of people go, yay, as everyone's drowning in the sea. It's not the most prettiest picture, but then again, we paint pictures of Noah, I suppose. It's the same sort of thing. Um, but, you know, can you imagine? They're all just rejoicing because they had no way to defend themselves. There was an army coming for them, but their God is now freeing them from their captors once and for all. You can imagine that everyone's just dancing together, but even individually they're all rejoicing because each person knows they're free and they're selling their freedom with each, celebrating their freedom with each other. I mean, if you think about it, this is what we've been talking about. This is what Steve and Mike have been sharing about as we've been going through Exodus, our journey as Christians. You know, we talked about Passover, where the, the Israelites were slave, enslaved. And we know that we were slaves to sin. And yet, they did as Moses commanded, and they sacrificed the lamb. And we know that Jesus gave his life for us. And then they trusted that blood would save them. And so, and so it did, because the angel of death passed over them. And, it, and only, t only killed those where there was no blood on the doors. And so we also trust in the saving nature of Jesus' blood, that he will save us from it all. And then, you get, then they head off away from their captors into the desert, probably going in directions they never intended to go and often wondered why. And we often find ourselves wandering off. Not wandering off, that's probably the wrong phrase. But, you know, God taking us in directions we never thought we'd go in. But it's because God was good and he had a plan. And then we come to the, the Red Sea. And there we see that, as Paul says, the Israelites were baptized into Moses as they crossed that Red Sea. And so we are baptized into Jesus. And what happens when they are baptized? They are cut off from their captors and their slavers. I mean, yes, they could go back, but they have to go and get themselves a boat or something and sail back if they want to go back to Egypt and have those garlic delights by the Nile. But in the same way, we're cut off and we can choose to have nothing more to do with that. So in other words, what I'm trying to get to is in the same way that the Israelites began their journey and they were set free and they saw their captors destroyed, shouldn't we be also rejoicing because we have been set free and seen our captors destroyed. And I would throw in here, if anyone's not been baptized, I encourage you to get baptized. It's not just a command of God, but it is. Jesus said, go and be baptized. But it's also, there's power in baptism. 
But isn't that what we should be doing? It's celebrating that, celebrating that we have been set free. And maybe, I suppose, thinking about it as I wander off on one of my tangents, um, you know, you become a Christian, and sometimes you do. And you're just full of energy, and you're so excited. But after a year, two years, three years, maybe you can get a bit tarnished, and you get a bit complacent. Familiarity breeds contempt, the Bible tells us. And we forget what an amazing thing he's done for us. So, our response should be that we want to celebrate. And to be honest, that's what I would love and that's what the desire of the leaders of the church, this church is. It's my desire for all churches, to be honest, but particularly this church, is we become exuberant worshippers. People who every Sunday just want to worship God. Not because of what he's done, but that's pretty good. But because of who he is. We sang a lot today about who he is because he is worthy of all praise. My, um, I was talking to someone this morning and they weren't feeling very happy. Things haven't gone the way they would like. And I was saying, go to church and worship God because he's worthy of worship anyway. doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't change who God is. But don't forget, God still cares for you. He knows how you feel. But still worship him because of who he is. And if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. So what happens in this? Let's just have a, a little bit of um, what went on in the, in the passage. First word, I. I. This individual is me. I. What will I do? I will. I thought in that last song we sang, Shout to the Lord, it said, I want to. I thought, no, I will. I said, no, I want to. I will. Nothing's going to stop me, no matter how I feel, no matter what's going on around me. As uncomfortable as that is, I will. And I can remember times when I've deliberately said, I don't care what's happening around me. I don't even care what's happening in the meeting. I am going to worship and sometimes that's been the most impactful worship I've ever had. I remember one time I chose to worship God. And I just thought, I'm just going to stand here, put my hands in the air and worship God. And I missed the pastor running around the room and up on stage and back down again. Because he got carried away with the Holy Spirit. But I missed all that. Um, we didn't video that sort of thing. I don't even know if we had video in those days. Um, unless you had an expensive camera. But the point was you choose to worship. So Moses and the community said I will and what will they do they will sing to the Lord they will sing to God one interesting thing just to say when you see Lord written like that that's the name of God that's how they do it in the Bible uh, when it's capital letters like that it means you're reading God's name He's not singing to any God. He's not singing to God my banner or God my shepherd or whatever. You know, all the wonderful attributes of who God is. They're singing to God. And I think sometimes we need to remember that when we come, we need to come through that door with an attitude that says, I will sing to the Lord. Whatever's going on, no matter how badly Keith plays the keys, or if I have to watch a video, the point is, I am going to sing to the Lord, and I'm going to worship him. I was reminded, we went to Norwich a while back, and we popped into a church, and we went in, it was a big warehouse, and the rooms, all the, door, all the walls were covered in black um, material. It's very dark. And there was a stage covered in lights shining from all over the place, a massive screen. I've never seen a screen as big as that, but I live a sheltered life. And um, yeah, it was doing all special effects. And on the stage was a large band, or, you know, your typical modern band, bass guitar, drums, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, uh, a keyboard or two. You never have too many keyboards. And drifting in from the left-hand side was smoke. 
birth gently blowing across the stage and at the front were the five singers all singing gloriously and skipping around each other with their wireless mics and all singing about that and you'd be forgiven for thinking that we in the congregation were the audience watching the band up on stage perform for us and then we'll just let God help us along when we need a bit of help I mean, thankfully, that's not here. Um, Peter won't let you have smoke machines, I think, if I, even if I tried. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, well, you know, you've got myself, the keyboard, and then Henry, who plays the violin so well. But we, we I mean, we do, I would love to have some more musicians. I, I, I want more musicians. But, you know, we don't, you don't have that. I don't think you come in the morning thinking, oh, great, it's the performance. Keith is going to play and sing songs for us. I can't imagine that. But that's the point, isn't it? Because we need to remember that we're not the audience, we're the performers. And the audience is God, is receiving this. And the musicians are just there to help you perform. That's all it is. And that's what I want, you know, I, I just love that. If, Every Sunday you just come and you just sing at the top of your voice. It's, I, I, I'll tell you one thing, one thing I really do notice when I'm playing is when you guys really go for it, the guys here, I was sitting in the front, absolutely blown away by the volume of noise that comes and hits us. It's, it's amazing. It's just, it's just you know, to hear you guys just worship and we know you're really tuned in then and to hear that every Sunday is my dream. That you know, you just passionately turn up. There was a time in Cardiff where God used to, uh, God was doing some mighty works and people were turning up early. Can you believe they were coming early? They were there 30 minutes before the start of the meeting. Not only that, they started singing and the band weren't even on stage yet. And they were singing to God. And by the time the band came on, they were already into worship. And you think, oh, those are magical moments. They don't happen often, but they were magical because people just came and they worshipped. And they just wanted to glorify God and they just loved being in his presence. They couldn't wait to get to church just to join together and just worship. And as I thought about this, I thought, well... I can't imagine that the worship session these guys had together had, was very religious. Somehow I just can't imagine it being religious. About as religious as when your team scores a goal. Or when your team scores a try. Possibly when your team scores a four, but cricket's a bit boring, isn't it? But, um, you know, things, things that excite you, you know, when something exciting happens, that's what was happening. And then suddenly all religiousness stops. I mean, I don't know, I was thinking, can, uh, I've always found it challenging going to some more formal churches. I, I, as a, because a youngster, I grew up in a more um, charismatic church. Um, I, never, I, I never really got to experience properly or understand the more formal ways of doing worship, like you see at, say, the Anglican Church. I suppose it must be a little bit like the coronation, is it? You know, all that robes and regalia and stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, say your prayer, come along with the book and all that sort of stuff. But I'm thinking, contrast the two. You see, here, the worship was spontaneous. Imagine, imagine a football match like this, where, the, where the, the, the excitement is spontaneous. They've scored! As opposed to a very structured, oh, oh, jolly good, well done. Where, where they're all singing their different songs. Come on, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, they're all chanting different things. Come on, can I get up with it? Move yourself or whatever. Or, yeah, well done. Yeah, they don't all just say, well, we'll just get our hymn books out and we're all going to start singing this song together. You know, you'll never walk alone again. Again, you'll never walk alone. There is clapping, there's cheering, there's shouting rather than a very formal, let's be quiet. Don't say anything. You might wake somebody up. There can be, there's leaping, as I told you. There's dancing, especially if you just won the cup. They don't, uh, rather than that, let's all stand still. They raise their hands. You know, people say, why do we raise our hands in church? Humans naturally raise their hands when they're rejoicing and praising. 
they're giving their glory to God, but at the same time, they're just rejoicing. But, but you know, so many keep their hands in their pockets. And they're smiling. There's happiness and laughing, rather than, rather than somber reflection. It's, it, I used to think it's so crazy that I used to meet so many people who said, well, that's just not the way I am. And yet, if you, if you took them to go and see somebody kicking a pigskin round a green field, it totally is the way they are. And they got more excited about a ball being kicked around than they seemed to be about a creator God who loved them. The saviour, the victor the one who is only worthy of all honour and all our praise. I mean, I'm not trying to condemn, I'm not trying to point fingers, because everybody's worship is personal to themselves. Some people will land flat on the floor, some people will jump up and down, people have their hands in the air. The point is, is I'm not interested in how you express your worship, or what I want to see is you worshipping. I just want to encourage you to worship with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And if that means it's like this, great. If it means it's down there, great. Whatever it is, just let go and let God. Don't let your pride and inhibitions get in the way of worshipping the King of Kings. Now consider how this song has arisen from deliverance. He has redeemed them, it says, from their enemy. But more than that, he destroyed the enemy. So there was deliverance and destruction. I sometimes think this is where we sometimes go a little wrong in church. We sometimes forget, dare I suggest, the masculine side of things? God destroyed. He hurled. He swallowed them up. He destroyed them. He didn't just deliver them, which is nice. He destroyed the enemy. And so with this deliverance and destruction comes conquest. We read in Revelation a little bit later on where finally when he's done everything he's done and he's judged the enemy and thrown the demons and devil into hell. Uh, the response of the people of God, which is, Hallelujah! The Lord reigns. Hallelujah! One of the most sobering songs in Handel's Messiah, I always think, because they, everyone loves the Hallelujah chorus, but the Hallelujah chorus follows judgment. But we need to remember, but the response is, Hallelujah! So, why is our response not hallelujah, that spontaneous hallelujah, every day as we realize he has conquered death and hell? In fact, Paul reminds us, doesn't he, that in all things, doesn't he, he says, um, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, or any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are more than conquerors. Isn't that worth spontaneous celebration? Okay, David Pawson gave some interesting points from this passage, I thought. He, he points out how worship contains a few balances. There's the balance between what has he done for us and what is he doing, if you see what I mean. So here we have, he has, he has done this, he has done this because he is going to. You know, he saved me from the past. He saved me from death. He saved me from hell and delivered me for the future, which is eternal glory with him. It says, doesn't it, the, the people you have redeemed so that you bring them in and plant them on your mountain, on his mountain. He's, they talk about the future. Worship is about, you've done this, but you're also doing this. 
It's about the acts and attributes of God. What did he do? He hurled. Good thing I'm not in America. That's rather an unfortunate phrase. But he hurled. He drowned. He did. He destroyed. But we also, as we go through, I would, would ask you to shout them out, but it would probably take too long. But he was glorious. He's, he's amazing. Awesome. So worship regards, at one point we're saying, great, you've done these amazing things for me. At the same time, you're just amazing. So that's why we have songs. That's why I do worship. Where my worship isn't just, when I try to facilitate worship, I don't want to just focus on, yes, yeah, great, you know, you've done this, and you've done this, and you've done this, and you've done this. Because those are all amazing. But I want us also to go, but you're amazing. You're, how great is my God? How great is he? Regardless of what he's done, you're still great. Regardless of how I feel, you're still great. You're still awesome. You're still the king of kings. You're still enthroned above all things. You're still worthy of all praise and honor. And I'm realizing the heating's getting hot. Another, for a third balance, we've had the past and the future, the acts and the attributes of God, uh, and we've got the justice and mercy. Uh, something that's interesting in worship, isn't it? You know, it's, it, we often, we're good at singing about the mercy. Um, not so keen about the justice. Although here, they have it all over the place. What did he do to the enemy? He destroyed them. He brought his justice. So you've got this, so we need to, I think it keeps us in perspective. That we need to remember God is a holy God as well as a loving, caring God. And, so I'm not doing my buttons, am I? And then the last one, which I couldn't really pull out very easily, was um, it's both personal and corporate. I will sing to the Lord. But then we will sing to the Lord. Moses and the people sang together. So each person was giving their own personal worship, but they were doing it together as a people. Miriam, when she exhorted them to sing, said, I will sing of my Redeemer, and we will sing of our Redeemer. Individual, together, private, but public. That's that balance. Brings me back to that whole idea of bread of heaven back in the Welsh game. That corporate singing. Because if you think about it, when we come to meet on a Sunday morning, our role isn't come here to have a good time. I mean, I hope you have, but you have a good time. It's, in some ways, it's not even to meet with God, but that is partly it. But our role is to come and exhort each other to worship the Lord. I'm here to encourage you to stand up and praise God, and you're exhorting each other. And in your, in your energy, you know, it's infectious, and we exhort each other just to worship him. So, it's so will you commit? We could, say, we could actually play that, um, how great thou art again, couldn't we? Will you commit to just worship him no matter what? To give your all in your worship at home, but especially when we meet corporately together, that we as a body of people will be known as a church that worships. We'll no longer be called Burning Community Church, we'll be called the Worshipping Community, or something like that. One that loves to worship God. And you know what? When we do that, as I said earlier, if we draw near to God, He draws back near to us, and we will experience the presence of God, possibly like we've never experienced before as he will do things and he will work miracles because he's a good God. Or, you know, maybe your passion's grown cold a bit and you just need to commit. I, I don't know what the right word is. It's not covenant, but you know, but you know, decide that you're gonna worship, no matter how you feel. And I suppose let's just go back to that Revelation 15 because they sang a song at the end, didn't they? And it said, it said they sang the song of Moses and the Lamb's song. As someone pointed out, that's the 
first song in scripture, which is Moses' song, and the last song in scripture, which is the Lamb song. The first song where it celebrated how Jesus or God brought his people out from Egypt. And the Lamb song at the end of the Revelation is about how God brought his people in. It's a celebration of both redemption and coming to fruition, I suppose. It's like being, it's like being saved and being saved. You know, you were saved then, but you're coming fulfillment of that salvation. And what do they sing? They sang, Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear your Lord and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Let's covenant or commit that we're going to be an exuberant worshipping church that just wants to glorify God that when we come on a Sunday we will leave all our baggage at the doors whatever they may be and I know some of you are facing big situations right now some of you have been hurt I can think of one person now who's not here but she's hurting but you leave that at the door and you worship the God who is worthy of all praise and all honor. And we just say how great you are. And then just let God move and touch. And as you draw near, he'll draw near.